I'm driving an 1886 Benz pad motor wagon in a video game. I must be playing Gran Turismo 4 for the PlayStation 2. As you can tell, it looks a lot different from Gran Turismo 3 apart from the tracks and cars. It feels more like a reboot than a sequel. It has that glamorous and prestige feel. The menus, the lounge music, and loads of real life circuits. My problem with it is that it doesn't make me feel as excited for a race as its predecessors. It just feels soft. I know I'm going really deep, but this is honestly how I felt the first time moving from the third game to the fourth. The first time I played this was outside the booth of a motor show, and didn't even realize it was a Gran Turismo game. Now at the time, the glamour of motorsport was increasing, especially with Formula 1, and it just sort of carried into the Gran Turismo series, making the game feel modern. That's the thing with the GT series, each game sort of defines an era of racing. Despite the gigantic presentation change, a lot of the music in the game were taken from the predecessors and remixed. You can tell this game looks much more serious when the dials and gauges are no longer orange. Nobody can deny that this is definitely one of the best looking PlayStation 2 games ever made. Before the PS3 came out, it was nothing like I've ever witnessed before. It's one of four PS2 games that are HD compatible. Unfortunately, I don't have a North American system, so I can't demonstrate, but what a technical achievement. This one I found a need to play GT mode only, because it's the only way to unlock all the cars and tracks in arcade mode, which is reasonable. At least you don't have to change discs. Apart from that, nothing from arcade mode has changed. You have a choice of time trial, single race, and two player. Although you have more control over the race settings, Gran Turismo mode is what it's all about. Once again, the license tests are mandatory to getting anywhere in GT mode no matter how much you hate them. But was it necessary to have twice as many tests, with a quarter of them being the same one with a different car? Why? And I've counted them all. 80 tests. Seriously. I never had to do that many tests to get my own driver's license. And to add insult to injury, there are these coffee break tests that have no rhyme or reason. If I want a coffee break, I turn the game off. When it comes to license tests in a Gran Turismo game, these are the worst. There are more than any other in the series, and the hardest to pass. But, there is one redeeming factor that almost makes up for it. Normally when you obtain a license in the predecessors, it gives you access to higher level events. But in this, you also get a prize car. So my strategy is to keep the starting 10,000 credits, get all the licenses, and use the Nismo 270R obtained from the International A license as my first car. This is one of 700 cars available in Gran Turismo 4, most of them modifiable and others you can only get by winning particular races like the Mercedes-Benz CLR GT1 Le Mans racer. I just hope this particular model doesn't go airborne on me. Oh my god, oh my god. The used car dealers took some accounting lessons over the last four years because they were able to find the money to bring the used car dealerships back in business and there are plenty of cars to start with. But like I said, obtaining licenses earn you prize cars. Just do that instead. There are some cars you'd never expect to see in a video game, like the aforementioned Benz Pad Motor Wagon and Model T Ford. Some are even made for this game, including the Jay Leno Tank Car and Nike 2022. We're still waiting on it. That being said, I cannot believe supercar names like Ferrari, Lamborghini, Porsche, and Maserati don't make an appearance. Most eventually made it to Gran Turismo 5, but really? Maybe I should try and go back in time and tell those developers at Polyphony to add these manufacturers post haste. Okay, while my driver is trying to travel back to 2004, let's talk about the circuits. There are over 50 of them in Gran Turismo 4, real and fictional. Well, 38 if you don't count the shortened variations. It's good they brought High Speed Ring and Autumn Ring back. Yes, most of the GT classics return looking more realistic. The fantasy-like feels taking a back seat on this one, no pun intended. But the number of real-life circuits has skyrocketed compared to the predecessor. Not only do you have Monte Carlo and Laguna Seca, but also Suzuka Circuit, Fuji Speedway, and even the Nürburgring to name a few. I wonder how long this took to design. The Laguna Seca's corkscrew corner isn't as steep in real life, and there are a few tracks where the corner can be cut like Fuji Speedway 90s on the chicane, and Le Mans Circuit chicanes on the long straight. But it's good to see so many tracks in such detail for a PlayStation 2 game. In Gran Turismo mode, over 500 races are scattered all over the map and vary between beginner, pro, extreme, endurance, and rally. The usual ones, and winning them give you money and cars you can't buy from a showroom. 
Years ago, my brother and I found a very ingenious get-rich-quick scheme that I still use to this day. Here's how it works. Obtain a National A license, purchase a reasonably powered car, go to the Easy Capri Rally. Now, even though you get five second penalties for hitting a wall or a barrier, look what I'm doing. I'm skimming on the corner. It's a very easy and cheap way of winning in this race. But considering the ridiculous penalties you get and the opponent gets none of those, I don't feel bad about it one bit. Win both normal and reverse, you win a Toyota RSC Rally Raid car, sell that car for over 250,000 credits, rinse, and repeat. Yes, you can redo the event from the start and win the same car over and over again. There might be a few of you guys that have better money making schemes in this game, but this is what I do when I'm strapped for cash. With so many events in Gran Turismo 4, you have not hours, but days, maybe weeks of gameplay at your disposal. I wonder if Polyphony rewarded anyone for reaching 100% with a real car or something. The long gameplay is thanks in large part to the endurance events. You still have some of the usual ones like the 150 mile super speedway and Grand Valley Speedway 300 kilometers, which seem like a traditional Gran Turismo. But you have 4 hour Nürburgring, 1000 kilometer Suzuka, 1000 kilometer Fuji, 24 hour Nürburgring, 24 hour Le Mans, with only 6 vehicles on the track. Good God, if you've completed all these races, you would have clocked more gameplay time on Gran Turismo 4 than any other PS2 game combined. Surely having race events this long can't be good for your system or yourself. I guess you could say these particular events are tests to see how well your console has aged and your ability to avoid sensory deprivation. Driving missions are introduced in Gran Turismo 4, but wouldn't return in another one. This is another way of adding more to the gameplay, gaining credits and earning special prize cars like the Bagani Zonda race car. These are more like overtaking missions, where you start a particular distance from your opponents and have to reach the finish line before they do, no matter what the cost. In terms of things to do and collect, Gran Turismo 4 is in a league of its own, if you're good at making time. Driving controls. This is going to be really hard to explain because I don't know whether to criticize the reduced feel or praise the realism. Apparently, actual race drivers believe the steering is incredibly realistic and found it difficult to notice any difference from the real thing. It's hard to disagree with race drivers in that regard, so I'll take their word for it. The driving controls are realistic. I don't know, the way I feel is that it takes the fun out of the game. Sometimes even with good cars, the understeer can be so appalling you'll literally scream at the TV to make the car turn. But because the driving controls are realistic just as a racing simulator should, you can't really criticize it for being more true to the slogan. Real life drivers have to deal with controls like these, so does the person who decides to play this game. It's a simulator. At the very least, I can admire the effort and attention to detail put into the controls. It all comes down to preference. The only way to unlock its potential and enjoy this style of driving is to use a steering wheel. A Logitech one in particular. These ones are made for Gran Turismo. There's also a point system as well. You win them depending on how easy or hard you make the race. For example, if you pick a car to race that would easily blow away the opponent to get less points and a slower car will give you more. It's basically a meaningless Atari 2600 high score like system. Seriously, it does nothing and I didn't even notice until I was reviewing this game. If it affected how much prize money I won, then I'd pay more attention. Whenever you need to pit in, oh look, they've added full animations of the pit crew changing the tires and filling up your car. How about that? Gone are the days when an invisible jack lifts your car up. Anyway, when you pit in, you can change between A spec and B spec, where you can be the race instructor telling your race driver to take it easy, push it, pit in, overtake. But considering how poor the AI is in this game, this one's no different. Yeah, he's still trying to get that time machine to work. This is useful for endurance races, and you can even switch between yourself and the AI, just like a real endurance race. The idea of two drivers, not an AI racing around the track in real life. At least the point system actually makes a difference in B-Spec. The more points you gather, the better your AI driver will be. Speaking of more than one driver, online multiplayer was going to feature in Gran Turismo 4. In fact, they did a tech demo, but it was too complicated and scrapped it. I personally wouldn't have cared for it, but I admit, it would have been extremely competitive. At least the opponent would know where the other drivers are on the track. Because the AI and single player literally sleep drive, it's guaranteed they'll pit maneuver you in a race, or at least try to. 
The rest of the games in the series have the same problem, but I'm addressing it in GT4 because I thought it reached a point in the series where the AI should have been rectified. Not only that, but how could you come this far into the series and still have no car damage? Granted, doing this for over 700 cars would take a really long time to do, but a racing simulator with no car damage makes less sense than jumping off a cliff to prove to your best friend that you have a pair of shoes. At least it means you can bash into other cars without any worries which help around the corners, and if you're racing a big event like the Gran Turismo World Championship, you'll be very thankful. Gran Turismo 4 set its mark from a technical standpoint. Like, can you name another console racer that has more cars and tracks along with graphics this detailed before 2005? In fact, it's aged rather well when you think about it, and it was very successful too with nearly 12 million copies sold, making it the third best selling title on the PlayStation 2, only behind Gran Turismo 3 and Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. However, the reboot-like change takes a bit of fun out of the series compared to the predecessors. It's a fantastic racing game, but this isn't my style. It's too serious. But like I said at the beginning, high-level motorsport has gone more glamorous over the years. If you compare the number of cars, tracks, events, and songs to the predecessors, it took a huge quantitative leap. The series would continue to have glass menus and city cafe music, but for Gran Turismo 4, you get tons of cars with lots of tracks to race on. And that's all you really need in a Gran Turismo game. 